That's awesome. I love uh, that. Talking about that's a great story. I I didn't even know that. I learned something new every day. Um, <laughs> I'm aware of every day. Just kind of What's up, football fans? But most importantly, UFL fans. Welcome to episode nine of Polar Opposites. We're back. It's Ace. It's Web. It's KB in the back. Kenny, we miss you, man. But we're here to talk football, UFL. Week one is done, and I cannot wait. Can you wait, Web? No, no. I, I'm excited, man. Like it's finally football. We've done this for such a long time with the USFL, um, and now like we have a great league. Like all of the games are pretty good. So I agree. Let's get you know, to it. We can't wait, but we got to wait just one second because roll the music. All right, Webb, we got a great episode today, but we got to start off with our fan question. Our fan question is a question that we're going to ask you as fans, and we want you to comment with your best answers. You know, make it fun, make it mean, I don't care. Let us know. I think it's incredibly fun. Last week, we said, who would win out of the starting quarterbacks in a WWE Royal Rumble style match? Uh, I got a couple Jordan Tamus. I got a Luis Peta, Luis Peta as clears. Um, it was a fun time. I liked reading all those. So we got one that is definitely going to breed some good answers. KB, what is our fan question this week? Our fan question this week is what is your ideal expansion team? All right. So ooh, for this ooh. one, we're actually going to give you our answers. So Webb, you want me to start or you start? You can start. You can I'll start. start. All right. So. I am picking the Chicago Enforcers. I'm going less Homer, less, I don't know. It's not like I knew the players. This is the 2001 XFL team, the Chicago Enforcers. Now, I'm saying that because Chicago doesn't have a team. It would be fun to get a northern team up there in the Midwest. You know, we have the Michigan Panthers. I think it would be fun to get a rival, like a real Midwestern, NFC North type rival. So I like the Chicago Enforcers. Purple is my favorite color. I think it works better than the purple and orange that we saw recently in spring football. And I just think it's a fun name. I think it's something you can do cool things with. You know, they have, you know, admirals, commanders, enforcers. I think you can do cool things with that. So these uniforms, I think, were ahead of their time for 2001. And I would absolutely love to see a modernized Under Armour version. So mostly aesthetic and just where it is. That's what I really like about it. I think the Chicago Enforcers would just be a fun team. And, you know, 2001 XFL, it's a way callback. I was like five years old when that happened. Uh, I think it would be a fun time. Webb, you ready for yours? Yeah. Who you got, mine's, my man? Mine's pretty, if you follow me, it's pretty obvious, man. Like, I want the Pittsburgh Maulers. But I, I want the Pittsburgh Maulers, yellow and black, not the purple and orange. I want them in the city of Pittsburgh, not Canton. I want Ray Horton being the, the head coach. I want Jaron Horton. I want Mark Hole. I want Steve Meyer. I want I want Mark Gilbert. You got a picture of him. I want him from the Stallions. I want I want uh the nostalgic team from last year. I, I fell in love with that team. I fell that that's what really made me continue covering spring football, that team. Because the first year I did the breakers and I just didn't feel connected. This team was a special team and going up there to see him in the championship and all that. So that is my pick. That's it's kind of a homer pick. It's kind of a homer pick, but uh, if if it wasn't the Maulers with Horton and Hole, um, it would definitely be. I I love the idea of a team in Nashville. Nashville Tuners would be actually pretty cool because that was the trademark that Fox uh, USFL uh, registered for recently. So um, I I think Nashville would be a perfect market for this league. So because it kind of fits that footprint. It, it, it's close enough to Memphis, obviously, Birmingham, but it's also closer. It's more north to go along with Michigan and St. Louis. St. Louis is kind of on the same line, but it, it just brings that geography together, which if they stay in that footprint, it makes perfect sense. So I agree. And I'm glad that you brought up the Nashville Tuners because that is what inspired this question. Our Stallions representative, Buck, he found out that the US of, or UFL Enterprises, USFL Enterprises, uh, yeah. USFL Enterprises had applied for trademarks on the Canton and Ohio Bulldogs and the Nashville Tuners. You know, this is after we've gotten a report where I'm trying to remember who was talking. 
and they said they, they brought up expansion. Greg Williams. Greg, Greg Williams, Williams. Yes. Greg Williams was talking about how next year they're trying to add two teams and build. It's like really, really fast to be talking about expansion, but it came up. So I thought it would be fun if that was our fan question. Comment below. What team is your ideal team to come back? It could be from anything. It can be AAF. It can be XFL, USFL. If you want to make one up, go for it. I don't care, man. All right. Now we move on to our first topic about week one. Now, KB, what is that topic? So that topic is, I would like you to tell our fans one move that you would make up or down on this week's power rankings. All right. All right. So one move we would make, one team moved up or down on the power rankings. Web, I'm going to let you go first. Man, I I was, so we're prepping for the show and we know the topics. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to say. Um, I like I, I got kind of free balling it right here. But uh, I would say Arlington is too high. I think okay. Arlington had a good half, hung with the Stallions, but the Stallions have the number one offense because they were able to do whatever. They, they have the number one passing offense. They have the number one rushing offense. They have the have the most points. And Arlington, after that half, which, like, you're the opening game. It's XFL. Like, it got it was a little chippy. I don't know if you could tell. I know you were there. Oh, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. On, on TV, it, it came across chippy. Like, you saw the hit with Sternberger that's uh, on Fox that News Fox today, News right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on Scout's video. Um but that second half, it just felt like Arlington was not there. I, I think the two teams that are below them have some things to fix. Obviously, we'll get into that because they're facing off and there are teams. But I think Arlington, I just, and I predicted them to be two and eight. So maybe I don't have high expectations anyway. I just think they're a little too high here. Uh, I mean, I can, I can agree with that. I watched the Arlington game and I think other than one blown coverage, they really played mediocre to bad the entire game. But, I'm going to be a homer pick here, and I'm going to say I would move the Houston Roughnecks up to seven. <laughs> it's one move. It's just one up. But I think uh, the defense alone, they led in every category except passing yards against. So they were number one in rush yards against. They were number one in uh, points against. You know, you got to think we lost 18 to 12. We did not give up 18 points. One of that was literally a fumble recovery for a touchdown that the defense had nothing to do with. They stifled Darius Victor. Uh, he so how had many almost no did yards. They give up? How, many, how many points did they give up then? They gave up. That's a great question. What did they, they gave up one touchdown. The one touchdown to yeah. Vinny Papali, which was, I mean, I'll give it to him. That was a fantastic touchdown. Uh, okay. But then when you watch the DC defenders, EJ Perry played a pretty bad game. I'll say that. Like, he did not play a good game, and he was still managing to find a way to score. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, Chase Garbers. Uh, I mean, Chase Garbers. And, like, I'll give it to you. Brad Wing threw a touchdown, and that technically cannot be against the defense. Like, that's a tough one. It's on the special teams. But I think while we had the penalties, you know, at least we didn't spit on anybody, dude. (laughs) <laughs> bro, bro, that has that has i i knew i thought that was going to come later when we were previewing that game but that that has been handled it's been addressed it, hey, it has been on addressed. It, dude. he he has been released um he I, to tell you the truth he had the worst day out of anyone in the league uh, i know i said arlington was the worst but if you take away the De, lance gave up you know DC yeah. scored two touchdowns and his penalties took away two touchdowns. It was DC tough. wins that game. You had DC multiple comebacks yeah. that were ruined by yeah. this dude losing his cool. And he wasn't done there. He then went and lost his cool on Twitter all day long. This dude just has zero composure. Like, my yeah. gosh, dude. <laughs> Full it, it, must be, it must be a Florida thing. It's a Florida thing, dude. <laughs> Full implosion. At least I didn't spin on anybody, you know? So I would move the Roughnecks up to seven. And I think that's fair because then it will, we'll quickly know if I'm right because we play this week. So, yeah. you know, we play this week. That brings us to our next topic. KB, what is our next topic? I mean, let's talk about our game picks for next week. Let's talk about picks, baby. <laughs> this ain't Texas. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm losing it. All right, so we got our picks here. I love this graphic. We both went two and two. You know, we're we're, we're sharing a lot. We didn't even talk about how we went um, last week in our polls, but not a lot of people voted, so we'll catch up next week on that. But let's talk about our record here. We both Wait, went be, two be, and two. Before we go there, uh, we both predicted the upsets. We might not have picked it like me. I did not pick it. I did I pick picked, mine. I, I told you Michigan was going to play tough against St. Louis. I didn't think I agree. You know, they're a 64 yard kick away from losing that game, too, at the same time. Yeah. But I, I thought Michigan was going to play tough against. I think Michigan's a tough team. I, I um, agreed. I, I agreed with you. Playoff, so. I agreed with you. I wasn't as confident in it. But I was confident enough in the Brahmas that I actually picked them. I picked the Brahmas yeah, to right, beat the defenders, right. I, and I was I right. I will give you a hundred percent. I'm giving you that. Like you beat me last week. I don't care what the polls say. You beat me because the polls said actually, I won. The polls did say that I won. You, you yeah, smoked no, me in one of them. You smoked no, me, me in the Panthers. Yeah. yeah. Well, my game picks, and we both went two and two, so yeah. that doesn't even count anymore. But. I, I got a tip of the hat. You actually had the testicular fortitude to go with your uh, your uh, your underdog pick. So thank you, sir. So c- congrats <laughs> to to the hat. Well, this week, uh, you and I, we have only picked one game the same. So three yep. games we have picked differently. Uh, one of them, I'm a little bit crazy, but I just I feel it in my testicular fortitude. And so <laughs> you know, I got I got a little ballsy after last week. So this week we have three different three games that we have picked differently, which means we cannot be tied after next week. So this two and two record, this tied BS that we got going on, we will be done with it next week. One of us will be ahead. It might be you because I'm getting a little frisky, but I feel it. Uh, Let's get into each game. How about it? So first game of the week we have. That was a slow transition. Let me see. Uh, you asked me to actually bring it up. So this is 12, a, 12 p.m. 12 p.m. Eastern on Saturday afternoon. We have the yeah. showboats playing the Brahmas. This is in Memphis. Uh, it's at Simmons Bank Stadium. It's going to be outside. It's going to be hot. Webb, you picked the showboats. Why did you pick the boats? I just think um, after seeing... so. I know you didn't get to see a lot of the DC Defenders game until after and almost a condensed version, but I watched a little the, bit up in the press box at the Roughnecks game before the game started. I went up there, get some pot belly sandwiches and uh, there was Wi-Fi. So I watched a little bit of the game, but not enough to get a great so, feel. So did you, did you see like you saw like the first half, right? Or the second half? What second did you half, see more? Second half, because second uh, half. it was right before the Houston game uh, started. So I think I saw like when it got to the point where you guys really were done, where it was. It was kind of yeah, out of reach at that point. Uh, yeah, yeah, we were just spinning everywhere. Um, <laughs> so the the thing about it is, San Antonio, and I'll give uh, Josh at the Brown bullpen. He ripped apart all my comments, so I'm a little hesitant to go against San Antonio before Do I show it. up on the show Do next it. week. But I really believe that San Antonio got lucky last week because Greg Williams, Greg Williams. Wants to play fast and blitz, and we know that's what Greg's going to do. But Greg figured it out in the second half. So they scored two touchdowns at the beginning. He adjusted. The only other points he gave up was on a fake punt. I mean, a fake field goal, right? Then that the Brad Wing was not even supposed to throw to, right? He was not supposed to throw to. First of all, I want to call out Brad Wing because in the presser he's like, "Yeah, actually, we knew they're going to ice us, so destroy and miss the kick on purpose." I was like, what? Like, that, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like, you got a free rep. I, like, he said that. But whatever. He wasn't supposed to throw it to Alex Millette. Um, But they executed that, and I give them credit. Like, if we broke it down on DC Defender Show enough that I don't really want to talk about it anymore. And then <laughs> then the last touchdown, Tiamo threw his uh, interception, and it was almost a pick six. Me, personally, I would have let the pick six because this clock in this league moves so fast. It like with like you do not have time. You like give the them time, time to is kill. always yeah yeah. So they're able to run a couple plays. Garbers gets in. That's the second touchdown. But outside of that, San Antonio didn't move the ball. Yeah, they, like they they really he was high. He was efficient, and I believe Memphis's defense is going to be. He got some film on Garbers now. I, I think Memphis defense with Carnell Lake will be able to figure this out. But here, here's here's my biggest thing. We covered the USFL last year, mm-hmm. right? MBT was that big 
quarterback switch that was coming into a new system, and his head coach was who? John DeFilippo. Okay, and they played who week one? I don't know if you remember. Pittsburgh Maulers. Which were the best defense in the league. Yes, right? they were. Memphis just played the best defense in the league. Let's be honest. Like they I did. know I've argued. That was crazy. That they, uh, for week one, the best defense in the league was the Houston Roughnecks. Yeah. Uh, do, do I think they're going to be able to maintain it? I don't know. I, I think their front seven is amazing out of this world. But I think Flip will be able to figure this out and be able to move the ball because Tiamo leads the league in passing yards. Yes, it did take him 45 attempts. But he was 20 <laughs> of – no, but listen, he was 20 of 28, right? At one point, he was moving the ball, and then he finishes yep. up 25 for 45, whatever it was. I, I I just think San Antonio, while they have confidence, I think Flip will be able to make the adjustments with Carnell Lake because I believe in Carnell Lake. We saw him in the uh, USFL, and they'll be able to figure this out. It'll be a close one. This is the one game when I looked at the schedule, I was like, ooh, this is a good one. So I agree. I think it's going to be a good one. I think the Brahmins are going to come out on top. Uh, their defense had four sacks against Tamu. I think when you're looking at it, the defender's offensive line was bad, right? So was the Memphis Showboats. They had a lot of the same deficiencies. They weren't able to get the run game started. You know, they said that they're going to try and lean on Trey Williams more this week and not put the entire load on Darius Victor. That's great. But I think Darius Victor is probably your best chance at getting like a good rush. So it's tough. I love Case Cookies. I think he still was able to be productive. I don't think any other quarterback in week one would have been able to be productive like Case Cookus was against the defense that we put up in week one. That was ridiculous. Our defensive line was just obliterating them. I mean, I told Case after the game of the presser, I said, dude, you, you spent the end of every single play on the ground. And he laughed because he was like, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you were getting murdered. And I think it's going to be more of the same this week. I think the offensive line cannot hold up. Wade Phillips defense is he he's built a good one. And I think Garbers, the offensive game plan was there. They knew they were going to get blitzed a lot. They were ready with blitz beaters. And so I think that they prepare well. I think first half of each game, I don't take that into account that much because the first half of each game, both teams were just trying to get, you know, the, the ball moving, the ball rolling. The Stallions didn't even look good against the Renegades in the first half. But in the second half, I think that the Brahmas, you know, they started getting into a groove a little bit. You, you know, they just, I think they're going to come in and be ready. Uh, you know, you can say, yes, the, the almost pick six that put them into scoring position, but they scored. We watched a lot of teams not be able to do that. We watched the Panthers get a goal line interception. We watched the, uh, you know, they threw a goal line interception. Then we watched the Battle Hawks get stopped on fourth down. There's good defenses in, the, defenses in this league. And when you go up against a DC defender's defense and you're able to punch it in, that does say something about your offense. So I do like the Brahmas this week. And I don't think the home field advantage is going to matter as much this week. It was loud in Houston last week. It was loud in San Antonio last week. I've seen Memphis's home crowd for game one. And I don't think it shows up and like down that. In the Yacht Club. You're I'm down, down in the, the yacht yacht. I am down in the yacht club. They only sell one side of the stadium. It's not like that loud. I don't think it's that much of a home game. Uh, I don't think it, it shifts momentum the same way that the other stadiums do. And I think that the Brahmas can match it. And I think they come out on top. I do believe it'll be a good game though. But we've been harping on this game enough. Let's move on to game two. Game two, we have the St. Louis Battlehawks at the Arlington Renegades. We both agree on this one. So let's just get this one out of the way real quick. The Renegades offensive line looked really bad. If they didn't have Luis Perez, they weren't going to do anything. He was throwing balls into very tight holes. And man, Mark Gilbert shut him down. Uh, what's his name? Tyler Vons. He, I think he had one catch. One catch, maybe. Yeah. He was absolutely shut down. He's their best receiver on paper. When you're going through all the attributes, they really had to rely on the fact that Deontay Burnett was just doing crossing routes and kind of just creating separation. And then Winstead got down the field and broke coverage. Outside of that, their offense looked stagnant. It looked bad. They could not get the running game going. The St. Louis Battlehawks, they at least still have the offensive pieces, right? They have the Wayne Gallmans. They have the Hakeem Butlers. They have all the receiving people that they have, man. They, they Anybody that they threw it up to, like you, you thought that they were going to catch it against the Panthers. I think that they're the more complete team. I think defensively, 
with Feeney, with PETA, they were really coming at him. And I think the Renegades are in for a hell of a day. What do you think? It's also in the dome. Yeah. So if DC and Houston didn't play this week, the worst offensive line was Arlington. Yep. Right. So they, they're the sixth worst. Uh, they're six right now on offensive line. They were uh, PFF grade of 50.3. St. Louis, they just could not execute enough. And Michigan was able to hang around and hang around and hang around. And they figured out how to win at the end. Yeah. I think, I think St. Louis comes back. Um, their run game. I know you talked about Wayne Gallman. I love him. Clemson guy. It was not existent. They was not existent against that front seven of Michigan. But I will say in Nakua, right? Nakua coming in for tech. He's Dude, basically he was a linebacker. Lying in. Yeah, I he's mean, basically wow. a linebacker. So the, the only question I got is Mike Rose injury right now. He did not practice. We're filming this on Wednesday. Did he did not practice it so far. So that, that's a big injury. But St. Louis actually had the best passing offensive line when the, uh, in passing situation, PFF grade in the league. So I think they'll be able to control. Arlington's uh, defense front seven, I think they'll be able to control the line of scrimmage a lot easier than they did against the Michigan Panthers. Mm-hmm. And I, I know I like to uh, talk in big metaphors and you know, it, exaggerate a little bit. This is the blowout of the week. I'm, I'm gonna, that's going to be my, that's going to be my new segment of the week. Blowout so of the week. All the yeah. This is the blowout of the week. So who's getting blown? Isn't it? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving it in. All right. All right so <laughs> we have fun on Next. this show, man. We have fun. I agree. I think St. Louis is going to put it together. I think it's going to be just an all around ass kicking. Now, this game, we do not agree on, but most yeah, people let, I, I, do. I'm, I'm going first. I'm you going go first. first, brother. Hit me with it. All right, all right. This, this is simple. Perry was the worst quarterback in all of the UFL this past week. He was worse than your boy, Gortano. Like he, Gortano had good card. stats. He, he's yeah, he, 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 he's a wild card. They're going against the best secondary, man. They have Gilbert Island, who's the cousin of Drell Revis. Absolutely. Basically locks down. down. Yeah, he, he's he's locked down. Then you got Lorenzo Burns on the other side. Never mind their linebackers. And then their front four can get to the quarterback all by themselves. Michigan's going to struggle here. Michigan's going to struggle. And I know I just called the blowout of the week. I wouldn't be surprised if this is. I don't think Skip... I think Skip try, is trying to figure out this offense a little bit, and let's see Matt Carell, you know, do a few different things. They're the number one offense in yards, rushing yards, passing yards, points. Carell is probably the most talented quarterback in the league. I think you called that as I soon did. as he signed. I, I just, I just feel their offensive line. I wrote down the offensive line for every team, and I, magically, I picked the best offensive line in every single game, and from their PFF grade. Interesting. So, um, and Ricky Pearson is a beast. Is it not person? Person. 11 carries. <laughs> oh, okay. I was like... it, 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 it is. It is. 11 carries, and he forced five missed tackles mm-hmm. on 11 carries. He is a beast. And I I just think this, this one's – I know it's in Michigan, and they have a great fan base, and it seems like Michigan always can figure out something in Michigan. I don't know if you ever realized that, like, like the crazy game against the stars last year. I thought Miracle. they lost like every home game last year, except no, the last no, one. They, no, I, I think they won two. Mm. I think they won two, okay. but they were four and 16. They were okay. four and 16. They, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like they were great. Um, I, I think even though Hills had moments, I don't think his offense is good enough to compete with the Birmingham stallions. Okay. So my rebuttal, Yep. the Birmingham stallions, their, their offense started oh, yes. getting going when they got the run going, right? So they really weren't able to... Matt Corral wasn't able to sit in the pocket until Adrian Martinez came in and he was able to run the ball willy-nilly, which the Renegades' defense didn't look good, right? They they were not stopping the run. They they weren't penetrating very much at all. When you go watch that, I'm, I'm surprised that the Stallions' offensive line didn't get the highest PFF grade because they really were not letting Arlington penetrate that much. Arlington would have to blitz an extra man to try and get, you know, the numbers game. But I think that the Panthers defense, they were legit last year. They're legit this year. They've proven it already in game one. They proved that they can go up against AJ McCarron and the probably most high powered offense, and they can slow them down. I think that they're going to do that. They are going to slow down the Birmingham Stallions run 
and they play a lot of man coverage, which you can get beat with Deion Keynes and stuff like that, Marlon Williams. But I think that they're going to hold them, and I think that they can pull out another one at home. They could go on and lose every other game, but I think that they're going to lock up C.J. Marable this week because also the, the Renegades weren't game planning that well. You know, Jaron Horton, when he tore him apart on Twitter with the C.J. Marable rush up the middle for a touchdown, they literally didn't even protect their A-gap, you know, in goal line coverage. A- insanity. I think that they are going to get after the Stallions offense in a way that the Renegades couldn't and, and can't. And I think that their offense is going to look better this week. I think they realize they have the one-two punch in Wes Hills and Matt Coburn. It looked good. Their, while their pass, pass protection was not great for EJ Perry, and that's why he ran in two touchdowns, their rushing protection was actually pretty good. Their, their offensive line was pretty good on the rush. I think if they rely on that, if they keep the game close, they can win this week. I think they can. And because they're at home, I give them that, that upper hand. Three of the, three of the top... Uh... Three of the top six rushers in the league are in this game. The Berg are no, no. Four of the top six are West Hills, and then three other guys. Three are on Birmingham. Stats. Yeah, Birmingham. I I think if if Adrian Martinez is able to come in and give that little spark, but I I think when Adrian Martinez came in, it settled down Matt Corral. Um, he got to spend some time on the off, uh, on the sidelines, and it settled Just him down. I know it, and and. Go through the emotions. Sit on and, his Microsoft Surface. Buy one at your local store. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many times do we hear about how they get live footage on the sidelines? But um, I don't know, man. I didn't watch. Um, what I watched one game on TV this weekend, and I was at a bar, so I didn't hear any of the announcing. Enough. I don't know what it sounded like. Yeah, yeah. I know it, when I watched it, the highlights, I already I heard some some. Oh, that's good for the under fans. That's good for the. I was like, oh, come on, man. Let's not bring that part of the XFL here. Come on, man. That, that was a good. lot in in your in your game. That was the most. Like if oh, I had to yeah. grade the top four about talking about over and under, yours was the most. DC was second, both ESPN ones because they were promoting the ESPN bet, and then the Fox yeah. ones really weren't. Not Joel Klatt's not talking gambling. He's not Joel Klatt, dude. Oh my gosh! Just in the highlights, I could tell that he was spitting facts. I love Joel Klatt so much. Yeah. He's my yeah. he's my role model, but. Okay. All right, so there you go. This is going to be the most polarizing game. This will probably win you the poll alone, is the fact that I am saying that I think the Michigan Panthers could win. Also, lone Michigan Panthers fan uh, that was in Boomer Jacks in downtown Arlington with us, like we were sitting there, we were all cheering, and out of nowhere, when EJ Perry ran in the go-ahead touchdown before the St. Louis came back and like got ahead by one, uh, we all cheered and we heard a random cheer in the restaurant and we turn around and there's this woman decked out in Michigan Panthers gear in a booth alone. She's alone behind us. And we were like, what? Because, you know, Maverick, he's got his Panthers hat and a Panthers jersey on uh, from Royal Retros. And we're sitting there and we turn around. We're like, no way. And she looks at us. She's like, go Panthers. And we were like. Yeah, and we were all in. We were we were like Panthers it is. It was awesome. So if she sees this, you made our day. I absolutely love that. She's one of the realest Panthers fans I've ever met. There you go. But let's move first, on to the First last. of all, before we go, that game, the social media teams going back and forth, calling each other battle uh, pause the law and yeah. um, battle chicken, battle, battle pigeons, battle, battle pigeons and and jungle kitties and all that. They used all those terms. I love it. I love it. When you're able to oh, sit well. at home and you look at the, you look at your Twitter feed and it's two official accounts going back and forth. It's not me and you going back and forth, which we expect this weekend. It, it, it was an exciting enough game that it got Maverick to tweet. It got Maverick to tweet and he finally tweeted and it got more likes than anything I did this weekend. So that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, man. But we move on to the last game. Do you know what the last game is, Webb? Do you know what it's, we're talking it's about? It's polar opposite mania. It's polar opposite mania. It is your team versus my team. Mono, Imano, the toilet bowl. <laughs> it's the DC Defenders against the Houston Roughnecks. It is the home opener for the Defenders in Audi Field. I'm going to go Here's first. Next. I'm going to go first. Okay. Roughnecks win. Roughnecks win. Why? Defense. Your turn. Defense. That, that's, all, that's all you got? Defense, your turn. Okay, so this offense has the most passing yards. Cool. Right? Um, Forty-five. Reggie Barlow. 
Oh, oh, hold on. He was 20 of 28 and had most of the yards before that. Um, Reggie Barlow st- said today on the media availability that they expect Darius Higgins. One of the biggest problems I had with the active roster on this past Sunday was that the the running back room was Cameron Harris and Puka Williams. If you know anything about Puka Williams, he's smaller than anyone. Maybe Isaiah Henney might be the only one that's smaller. Why, he's like, on he's the Isaiah fantasy Henney. team. Right? So... <laughs> Puka's a returner, and he's kind of an outside guy. But like to to be able to run the ball in a league like this, you got to be able to run up the middle a little bit. It can't all be on the outside. Um, you have a great defensive line, absolutely great. Like some of my favorite Multiple. guys to follow, Multiple, Toby yeah. Johnson. Toby Johnson was my first interview ever in my entire life. I will uh, Olive Olive sent me a a video of him in a no shirt on in a Hawaiian sh- uh, Hawaiian break. Uh, Blanket saying happy birthday, Webb. Like I love your team, Ruben, I, I, Isaiah, Henny. Anything's anything's possible, right? It's a good team. But your offense is awful. It, it's it's, <laughs> it's brutal. Like, well, your offensive line got a passing block rate of eighteen point three. Mm. If you yes, double sir. that, if you double that, yes, sir. It does not. It does not pass number seven, which yeah, is the DC defenders. I think it no, just does. does. No, no, Pat. Okay, what's 18 plus 18? That's a great 30. 36. Six. 36. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm an engineer. <laughs> thank you, thank you, KB. I'm an engineer. He's got calculators. Don't worry, guys. He's got calculators. <laughs> um DC's passing block grade was a 39.8. Right? Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're so right. It does not. So if you double that, DC, if, if as long as I really believe that DC <laughs> would have beaten San Antonio if they adjusted, if they adjusted a little faster on defense. And as long as Greg Williams does not fall in love with the blitz, which historically he has, oh, but he, he did adjust. He did adjust though. Like there, there's progress here. I think DC can win this game, and I think I put a 23 to 12 game. I, I gave you guys a defensive touchdown. 23 to 12. I no, but Whoa. here's the thing. Here's the thing. I think I think he starts to take a little bit more risk. And Gortano gets picked off, and it's Mike Joe. It, it's in Audi Field. Mike Joseph is famous for pick sixes pick in sixes. Audi Field. He he gets a pick six, so it's not uh, DC's offense scoring twenty three points necessarily. It's more Houston's inefficiency and shooting shooting themselves in the foot. There, there's only one team in this league that shot themselves in the foot. More than DC defenders, and it was the and Houston you, and, Roughnecks. Like, like, how do you get a fumble and then fumble right back? No, the Showboats did that. Oh right, yeah, we fumbled right. That's and right. then That's Vito right. fumbled. You, you fought. You you turn over the ball so frequently. I don't even know what's going on anymore, dude. Only three times, I think. Yeah, three times. Yeah, I got them all confused. And by that time, I'm going to be honest with you. By that time, everybody had so turned that game off. Oh my no, gosh! I was, I was so emotionally drained after San Antonio and have to listen to Josh text me from the field exactly. about this and the spitting and all this kind of stuff. Like I was just done with it. But beer snakes, lemon heads, it's time. It's go time. Oh man, I don't know. I just think so. You're crazy if you think that our offense is going to take chances. It just doesn't. They don't do that. Uh, if I've learned anything about Eric Price, it's Mark Thompson. He's Mark Thompson, what he's doing. Is Mark Thompson playing? I don't think so. Do you know? No, I don't think he is. Okay. So you don't have a running threat, which DC did. I mean, you know. San Antonio did. If you don't have a running threat, TJ Pledger is all right, but he's not uh, Lovett and McFarland like San Antonio. I'm not like, like, what are you going to put? Like, you have to. I think Garantano. I think Jared Garantano is going to use his legs more this week. He has to. That is the key. If he runs out of the pocket, if he takes off for yards and keeps your defense honest, I think that we can do it. He's just got to get the ball into Isaiah Henney and Justin Hall's hands. Isaiah Henney can't have a worse game. I don't know how he would do it. He had the worst game of his career, and I feel for the brother. But I think that this week is a bounce back week. We can't play worse. We literally could not play worse on offense. Like we we did nothing. You know, this guy on 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 online. He said that he vehemently disagreed with me that Jared Garantano was not the problem. He said, or yeah, he said Jared was the problem. He was sitting in the pocket for three to five seconds. I said, I don't know what you're smoking, brother, because I don't think he had three seconds to throw once. That was 
crazy. An 18.3 out of 100. I said it on my show. If you got that on your first test in college, you drop out. You're like, maybe it, it ain't for me. 18.3, nah. We're going to go do something. We're going to go get into the trades. and We're going to work with our hands because we're better doing that. Because my gosh, that is a painful score. But I don't think it can get worse. I literally don't think it could get worse. And we were still one drive away from winning that game, which gives me hope because our defense is that good. They were swapping out the defensive line every other play. I mean, it was crazy. We had a fresh defensive line every play. Case Cook is, he was never off the ground. Never. He was limping half the game. He was getting killed. Like, I just think that Jordan Tamu, after getting hurt last game, after getting hit that much, I think he's going to start having Vietnam flashbacks, and we are going to win. So We're so, going to win 6-3. Uh, to three. DC gave up four sacks. Three of them were in the fourth, or three of them were in the late third, fourth quarter when DC was just passing the ball the entire time, and they could just pin their tails or their ears back and just go for it. So I, I, I'm not, I, but DC's offensive line was terrible. I, I there was pressure on D, um, Tiamo the entire time. I'll give you that. Yeah, Francois came in and immediately but got killed. I've, I've seen your movie before. I've seen your movie before. So have I. I've seen this movie before. But here's the difference. It's not, you don't have Troy Williams. I think Jarrett is basically he, Troy Williams. He He's not. He's not. I think he is. He's not. He no, is. he's not Troy Williams. He's not. Henny, Henny is great. Obviously, they're, they're the same if we are going equivalent. Yeah, it's literally the same guy. I, I don't see how. I, first of all, your offensive line was very disappointing. I was expecting a lot more. So out of was I. Line. Oh my gosh, I thought we were going to be the best. We were by uh, far the worst. The only the only saving grace is Mark Thompson if he ever comes back healthy. Like, I'm going to be honest with you, because unless another quarterback, which, if you remember this movie, right, James Morgan started last year for the Maulers. Troy Williams came in and took over, and that's where they kind of got better as the season went on. Oh, so you're saying... Is your only Dude, so you're saying it's Nolan Henderson season? Honestly, or it might be, honestly, or it might be, or it might be your man crush. Uh, I don't think Reed Sennett, I don't think he works with this offensive line, brother. <laughs> I don't think that works. I love the guy. I don't think it works. <laughs> Fair enough. He's Nolan just, Henderson, dude, bring him out. Let so him be pretty. scrappy. Just, Let Nolan yeah. Henderson come out, be scrappy, run RPOs, just run the ball. Who cares? Just do it. Yeah. I'm in. So before we uh, go to KB, bring up our picks again. Let's go back to the picks. So we've been doing this for uh, three years, just about me and you arguing football love you, on love YouTube. You. Yeah, I love you too. I love you too. It's been a lot of fun. Every time <laughs> our blast. teams play each other, we the the poop talking because it's a family mm-hmm, show. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, gets sometimes gets intense. Last year we did a huge thing, and you're not prepared for this. We I know uh, where it's going, but I'm not. We 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 bet on the game. We bet on the yes. game between the Maulers and and a miss uh, Chris blew it. Chris blew it, blew it, and I had to donate money. I donated hundred dollars to the American Diabetes Association because Xander, one of our fans. So, um, what are we betting? That's a great question. Um, honestly, I I liked what we did last year. That it was that huh. we were we were um, you donate money to a good cause, and you know today I saw that our two teams they had the day off. Uh, or yesterday they had the day off and they went and they did uh, one of my absolute favorite things in the world. They went and they played flag football with a special needs foundation and they played uh, flag football with children with disabilities. And that's one of my favorite things. I did that all throughout college. My brother went and did that all throughout college. We coached kids with disabilities in soccer and flag football. And I absolutely, absolutely love that. So I'm going to say winner donates a hundred dollars to the best buddies foundation. That is an organization outreach program that pairs up uh, if you're in high school or college, you pair up a high school or college student that joined Best Buddies with a special needs uh, adult in the community and you hang out with them once a month and you call them twice a week and you're just you're their best buddy, man. And I did it all throughout college. And my brother, when I graduated, my brother took my buddy on uh, my man, PJ. He's still our friend to this day. Uh, PJ Walker. No, <laughs> uh, but I actually, so I wear two rings. I don't know if people Your notice wife that. Your wife was the best buddy? My wife was the best buddy in high school. 
Um, I don't know if people notice on my show, I wear two rings. So one ring, this is my wedding ring. I didn't always wear this on the show. But this ring is actually, uh, I don't know if I could even show it. It's, nah, it doesn't show. It's a Batman ring. It has the Batman logo on it. And I wear it every single day. It was a Christmas present from my best buddy, PJ. He does not have much money, but he spent the money to buy me a Batman ring for Christmas, my junior year of college. And I've worn it every, every single day since. So yes, winner donates $100 to the Best Buddies Foundation in America. I love it. You know what? If I lose this game, it, it's fine because I get to donate to one of my favorite, favorite organizations in the world. So. That's awesome. I love uh, talking about, that's a great story. I, I didn't even know that. I learned something new every day. Um, <laughs> I'm aware it every day. It's just kind of crazy because we did not plan this no. like about the bet. Like we didn't even talk about it because we were both disappointed in our teams this week. Um, while we're talking about charity, I do want to shout out to news hubs charity um, that they're starting the blood drive defender for life. Um, I was Mark thinking Perry, the same thing. That's uh, Mark, that's Mark, yeah, Mark Perry, uh, his wife became ill and she needed transfusions. And there's a huge story. If you go on the news hub uh, website and I know like Technically, there are competitors, right? But we're all part of this UFL community building this. Um, but if you can go to um, his Twitter account, I don't know if you can pull that up quick enough. Well, I can't. No? I went to their website. I thought it was on there. Yeah. Well, it, uh, their website, too. Um, but his Twitter account has a link to it. Um, right now, they're voting on what they're going to send out when you donate blood. Um, they're big DC Defenders fans. Uh, hopefully she can make it to the home opener. Um, it's still up in the air. He hasn't said it publicly, but if you watch his stuff, he has discussed it. That was the goal after she fell ill in February. Um, but they are uh, donating blood and they're trying to get DC fans um, because they live in that area to donate blood. And I, I can tell you from my feed following a lot of the beer snakes and lemon heads that it is supported a hundred percent, but if we can make this a UFL community event where everyone's donating blood throughout the entire season, um, I it can't hurt anyone. You know what I mean? Like ah, well, there it is. There you go. The Defenders for Life. Um, yeah. I think they're they're voting on what the logo for it right now to try and get the, the Defenders uh, community behind it. They're going to send a sticker of the logo to anyone that proves that they donated blood and they're UFL fans. Yeah, That's there's awesome. a. I, I think there's an option that um, you'll get a T-shirt with the logo on it as well. I so well, check the description when the show drops. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in there so that anybody who wants to donate can go donate and help it out. It's a great organi organization. Mark Perry is, you know, he's one of the OGs in this community, and I think every time he goes to a game, his wife accompanies him. And to have somebody by your side that does things like that with you is a really special thing. So, yeah, go donate to that, man. That's thank you, Web. This, this is this is a good episode. I'm loving this right now. Yeah. I'm losing my it's voice. Supposed to be our most, up. It's supposed to be our most hated episode, right, of the whole year because our teams play only one time. Let's make it a fun thing, man. Let's but, donate but to good love, causes. Man. Bring it in. Bring it in. Bring it in. Air Give hug. me a hug. <laughs> hug me, brother. <laughs> my generation gets that, but. Now, we've gotten past the Polar Opposites Mania, and we go on to KB's Blindside. All right, KB, your blindside question is? All right, so this is lengthy. I apologize. Well, I'm not going to apologize. I'm Don't just apologize. letting you know that it's lengthy. <laughs> um, an article by Greg Parks came out this week on uh the usfl the ufl board UFL board and it was about the usfl versus xfl rivalry and how it's kind of a stop and he called it a stop gap for marketing the league and building hype and i did send the excerpt to you in our polar opposites channel um on in our discord um, it says, in reality, the UFL as an actual entity is only about three months old. Mm -hmm. That's not enough time to forge an identity of one's own beyond yet another spring football league. Therefore, 
they've relied on the more well-known USFL and XFL monikers to carry the day. That's fine for now. Eventually, the UFL needs to stand for something more than the merger of two spring football leagues that struggled to survive on their own. And fans and players need to understand that the continued tribalism, while fun for now, may wear out others in the long run who just want to enjoy watching spring football played at its highest level. So my question is, do you guys think that the league will have to lean into something else or they, can they continue leaning on the USFL versus XFL rivalry? So I'll go first. I think they can absolutely rely on it this season. I think as soon as this season is over, you, you bury it. I think it's done. You know, I've already seen people online. They're saying, oh, I got to go mute everybody who's bringing up the USFL versus XFL. You know, it's just breeding hate, all that stuff. No, it's getting people to talk about it. And I get it. It's annoying. You know, you're saying, oh, they're both the same league. Well, they made them the conferences for a reason, because everybody wanted to know who's better, the USFL or the XFL. And what happened after day one, when the USFL went 2-0 against the, the uh, XFL, everybody talked about it. Literally everybody was talking about that. And so it's drumming up excitement for the league. And those games, the ones where it was USFL versus XFL, got the most views. So yeah, you're going to lean into it. And I get it. It can be annoying. But we're also, us, Greg Parks, Mark Perry, PFN, we're paying attention more than anybody else. The normal people, they're excited about it. They're not sick of it. Us guys who are just absolute fiends, we can get sick of it. But you have to at least give them this season to harp on that, and then we can let it go. What do you think, Webb? Um, I, it can't be just this season. It can't be. Not like, just this season. So I, I, grew, I grew up, and maybe this is old man Webb talking here, um, because you really didn't see this. But I grew up. I was born in the 80s, grew up in the 90s, right? So in the 90s, baseball, baseball, I'm going to talk about Major League Baseball. They had the American League and National League. And it mattered if your team was an American League team or a National League team. The All-Star game mattered. Who won the World Series mattered. Outside, as a Red Sox fan growing up, as long as the Yankees weren't in the World Series, I grew up always rooting for the American League team. It was like our brother. I think the league can be successful if they keep harping on USFL, XFL, because it creates rivalries. It, cre it made it a big deal. What were the two games that were most watched? Yes, I know they're on Fox, but which two games were most watched? I said that. It was the two games that were yeah. USFL versus XFL. Yeah. So it matters. It, it, it does. It mattered I to everyone. And I, I, I think as long as one team is not dominating, like, so the NFC and the Super Bowl, Obviously, you're an NFC. I, fan. Always, I, an I, NFC I usually, fan. I usually root for the NFC. Exactly. I typically, yeah. at, even as a Patriots fan, if it wasn't the Indianapolis Colts, I was kind of rooting for the AFC. I root for the Chiefs, right? Like, shoot, like that's the new dynasty. I, I think it's good. I, I think it's good. I, well, it's. I, I didn't get you because I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's in motion here. But I, I think it could be good if you use it right. It can't be like, hey, the XFL sucks and the USFL is good. It can't, it can't be that. It's just the USFL is better right now. This weekend, we got two games, right? Mm -hmm. San Antonio beat Memphis. Guess what? It's two to one, right? If you're Roughnecks beat Defenders, it's two to two. And, we, and me and you both disagreed with both of it. Yeah. So it could be two to two after this week and now the XFL. I think this article is Greg Park's. Being an XFL homer, it is complaining about it. His team went 0 2. His side went 0 2. I'm a, I, I was a USFL guy. You were too, right? Still you got right. an XFL name. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the other side, right? I'm on the dark side now. But I can tell you that, like, I'm rooting for the XFL. Like, we're in those group chats, right? I'm the XFL guy with the Brahma guy and the and Jay. And now Alex has kind of gone to the dark side, even though he stays neutral. But, like, and Brandon and you, 
are on a, a you two of the loudest ones, USFL, USFL, USFL. <laughs> I, I just feel like it's good. It creates conversation. Like it's yeah, an extra said, talking yeah. point. Yeah. And it's an extra talking point. And I think if you continue that, it it's nothing but great. But Man. I think I think but that I, have a our, I yeah, go ahead. So you're talking about message boards. Um Ace is talking about Twitter, but like does that sustain for the average person that doesn't know about sh- spring football? I kind of think like, so. Like, like, like how does that like how does that translate? I mean everybody that's on social media that's interested in alternative football is watching. Obviously the league needs to grow to sustain. Yeah. So No, I'm just saying like how how does the person who isn't on message boards and isn't on Twitter and like how do how do we how does that appeal to that person? I think it does. Okay. I think I think it does because I think while they are the average person, they do know that the USFL and the XFL were things. The UFL sounds a little weird to them. So they're coming in and they, you know, they say, oh, I think the USFL had better branding or I think the XFL had better branding. And I love Webb's point because he's right. I didn't think about it until like now. I mean, I knew I did it, but I didn't think about it in terms of this until right now. Yeah. If it's an AFC versus NFC team and I don't have a stake in it, I will root for the NFC team. And why is that? Because my homer pick is the Minnesota Vikings, and they are in the NFC North. And unless it's the Bears or Packers, and now kind of the Lions because they're getting good, I will always root for the NFC team. And I think he's right. What what are all of these leagues that we're talking about? We have the NFL, which is what? Two merged leagues. That's why. We had, was it the AFL and the NFL were two two leagues and they merged? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then they became yep. the NFC, 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 AFC, and then the NFL. Then we had the American League and the National League. Those were two separate baseball leagues, and they merged. Yep. That's why they have different rules. They have a couple different rules. Like I believe now, it's mostly just Everyone the designated the hitter. Now. Yeah, no, they, they all they changed have the it. Now. They changed it. Yeah, yeah, but how many years did that take? Right. So, well, yeah. so they were still, but they were still feeding into the fact that these were two separate leagues. So I think you're right. I think you can literally like the heritage of the league is built on the rivalry of the two leagues that came together to become one. And I don't think it's uh what what did he call it? It's a something stop, a something stop. Greg a stop gap, stop, a stop gap. gap. Greg Parks called it a stop gap. I get it. A lot of people probably thought the same thing when those leagues merged and they became the NFL and the MLB. But then eventually it stopgap shortens. It, it, it becomes less and less to the point where this is just how the league is. And you're always going to have the homers for each side. And that's a good thing because it creates rivalry and it creates talk. And when you're smack talking online, you know what that is? That's it getting out there. That's people seeing you smack talking. That's people jumping into your smack talk and they're jumping onto the side and they're saying, whoa, don't talk bad about the USFL to my guy. That is what keeps this league alive. That may be the reason that the UFL lasts longer than any other spring football league. Oh, right well, I, I, and, and KB, I, you knocked it out of the park. But KB, when you watch college football, what do you watch in oh, college football? Oh, so Big 12, I, did not, I did not knock it out of the park. The captain knocked it out of the park just for oh, yeah. your but, delivery well, is what just, sells yeah, it. It's a blind side. It's a blind side. Let's, let's, let's set the record straight. How many people came up with a computer until Steve Jobs sold it? There you right. Go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but when you watch college football, what what do you watch? I watch the Big Twelve. Big Twelve, baby. Do you watch the Big Twelve because you're a Baylor fan? Yep. Right. Like yep. in the SEC fans watch SEC when D- TCU is playing Georgia. Ace was all TCU, hundred like, percent. It did not matter. And me living down, down here, like, like fifty I, to fifty to seven, I was like, "You smell fan, that?" But whatever. But but that's that's the tribalism. Never, like the tribalism, never. the tribalism sells. I in agree. I agree. Sports, and I think I that that creates like number one sport is NFL right now, right? Because of the game. But the number two 
I would say it's college football. College it's, football is about tra- is. tribalism. It's and absolutely like even, about tribalism. Yeah. And even, even like, I'm a huge basketball fan. But college basketball, when it comes out in March, when I'm doing my brackets, I'm picking Big East schools because of UConn, right? Like, I, I'm like, oh, Marquette's pretty good because I've seen them all year. Creighton's pretty good. And I'm supporting them all the time. As long as they beat Baylor, who cares? I'm, I'm, but, um, I'm picking the Big 12. Why? Because they're the best conference in college football or college well, they, basketball. They they in were. college I'm, basketball, wait. they were the best. Yeah. Or they are the best. Okay. They just all I, I, fell off. I, I, how many Final Four teams? Zero. I don't know. Oh, okay. All right. I was just wondering. Still, eight, still, eight they ran yeah. the season, right. and you know that. But, yeah. yes, it is all tribalism. That's a whole other conversation. That, that's Dude, a, that's oh, a, my gosh. This feeds into <laughs> something that, um, that, that, that my dad and I talked about. So, spring football fans, look internal and realize for a second, we're weird. We're weird people. It's not a lot of normal people that are super, super into spring football. Yeah. We all know that. We're a little off. We love this, man. We get so into it. And I was talking to my dad about that because we were driving home from Houston. It's a three-hour drive. And me and him are just sitting there talking. And I was like, yeah, man, they're, they're kind of weird. Because my dad, he, he doesn't watch. Or he watches the UFL. He watched the USFL. He watched the MXFL. But he's not into it the way that I am. And on the way back, he was like, yeah. He was like, there's a lot of cats. They're like, they're super into it. He was like, it's kind of kind of weird. I was like, yeah. I was like, we are kind of weird as a community. Like, we're weird. And my dad said, it's because of community. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, it's because human beings as a species strive to feel like they are a part of something. They want to be a part of a community. And naturally, communities want to feel like they are better than other communities. We were created for community. We were created for community. But communities are also very territorial. So what do you do to make something popularized and talked about? You make sides. Look at politics. You make the two-party system because what happens? People pick a side and they get really into it and then they're talking about it. And that's what happened with the USFL and the XFL. People picked a side and they are vehemently protecting their side. You know, I'm out here, I'm always full bore for the USFL, and it's because I picked my side, man. I got into the league, I got into the players, I thought they were great, and now I just, it doesn't matter if we went 0-4 in opening weekend against the XFL, I would still pick the USFL because of tribalism, because of community, because I found my community. That's why. All right, I'm just going to end on this. You picked San Antonio Brahmas over the Memphis Showboats. Shut up, man. Showboats beat us last week. Showboats beat us last week. I, I, I screw him. I almost said a bad word. Screw him. I mean, like everybody can admit that their, you know, their sister can't sing at a concert. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you can, you can have that sense of community and still just know that, like, no, I, you know, we got I, our I shortcomings. My my, yeah. my kid, is, my kid isn't great at that. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like my dad's right, gonna look guys. at me. He's gonna be like, "That kid's never gonna dunk." You know, it's right? All good. Exactly. You know I, mean, I know it. It's all good. I had a kid that was not a team sports kid, but she was a state champion in bowling. Yes, I mean, and then she like had another kid who's never gonna reach the top shelf. She's Stop. never gonna reach the middle shelf. <laughs> but damn it, she's proud enough to ask somebody to reach it for her. So, there you go. She should have been a gymnast. That's all I'm saying. Pommel horse the, for days. I missed the boat on that. <laughs> Nobody's got lats like my kid. Right? Nobody right, has so, lats like my wife. That's right. Nobody. Nobody. All, all right. right. I Web. think we're done, guys. This has been fun. Good show. This has yeah. been a good all one. Right, guys. Comment, like, subscribe. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the UFM United Football Media. If you like that, please make sure to like and subscribe. Also, if you want more videos, you can check them out on our channel over here. The best one for you is right here. And then if you like mine, the rest of my playlist is right here. Thank you guys, and I hope to see you next time.